uh, I'm Rob Kaufman. I'm here to talk to you tonight a little bit about the Ruby debugger. Um, it's one of those things that you should be using every day, but a lot of people don't, um, mostly because getting up and over that initial setup hurdle can be a little frustrating. Um, and hopefully that I'll show you guys that it really is just that easy to use and it can be part of your workflow. Um, so this talk is called Ruby debugger um, beyond puts. Not really sure what's going on with the font on that slide. We're moving on. So the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, installation for the Ruby debugger. Uh, one little key piece of information that's often hidden in forums and on uh, back channels of IRC is that the library you want to install is slightly different depending on which version of Ruby you're working with. Since the Ruby debugger has a tremendous amount to do with the workings internals of the version of Ruby that you're using, they have to match. Um, for Ruby 1.8 MRI, it's Ruby Debug. For Ruby 1.9 MRI, it's Ruby Debug 1.9. Uh, there is a version of it that works on Ruby 1.9.3. Uh, this blog post will show you how to get the, um, the pre-release version of Ruby Debug that works on 1.9.3. Um, there are also uh, just the Jim install Ruby Debug and Ruby Debug 1.9 does work on uh, JRuby now. So if you're using JRuby, you can either do uh, Ruby Debug or Ruby Debug 1.9, depending on which version of uh, Ruby you're targeting with your JRuby app. Um, and there's a whole other crazy incantation that I couldn't find a good blog post on for getting it going with Rubinius. Uh, so these gem commands that I showed are here are just you know how you would install it in Ruby gems. If you're um, using your system gems, you probably need to append them with sudo. Um, that should all be pretty straightforward. Uh, the real trick here is knowing that you need to do Ruby 1.9 if you're doing Ruby 1.9. This is what you want to put in your bundler file, in your gem file if you're using bundler. Um, you notice that we have the platform call here. This means that your app will work um, and include the proper library, uh, just depending on which Ruby you're targeting. Uh, this is a general bundler tool and can be really useful for other uh, Ruby language dependent things. Uh, for instance, there's a different version of the Twitter gem for JRuby. And so you can target that specifically in your app and keep your app uh, compatible with multiple Ruby versions. Uh, basic usage. There are basically three really super common ways to get into the debugging prompt that I'm going to show you in a couple minutes. Uh, the first one is actually running a Ruby file with rdebug. Um, rdebug is a light little wrapper around the Ruby call, so you're replacing the call to the Ruby VM um, and saying, hey, run this file. What that does is it includes the Ruby debug library and sets a breakpoint at the very initial uh, point in your application. Uh, you can add debugger statements to a Ruby application. Um, and as long as you're including the Ruby debug library um, in your gem file or um, have a require for Ruby debug up in a higher place in the program, uh, it will stop at those debugger statements and kick you out to the debugger. Um, and then for those of us doing Rails, we can start the Rails server with dash dash debugger. Um, and if the Ruby debugger is available, it will then start your local server instance in either WebRick or Thin with access to the debugger. These are the default, this is the list of default commands for the debugger. Uh, you can see that there's quite a bit of them, few of them, and uh, they can be uh, a little esoteric. Um, if you're really into GDB, you'll recognize all of these. Um, in fact, if you use most debuggers, it's a fairly common set. Um, but of course, there are some differences, and uh, they're truthfully not all really that useful. Um, so we'll talk about sort of a subset. The most important one is help, right? Uh, Ruby Debug has pretty decent information about how to use the various commands. Um, they're terse. Uh, they give you enough to Google on uh, most of the time, but it's a place to start, and when you get in the Ruby Debugger, uh, and you don't know how to remember how to get out because you keep typing exit and nothing's happening. Uh, you can type help and you'll see that, uh, um, I guess in Ruby 1.9 exit is supported, um, but it used to be you could only use quit. Um, anyway, help in just in general lists all the commands that are available. 
And if you say um, help and then the name of a command, it'll give you both the abbreviation you can use for that command and whatever its arguments are. So I divided the commands up into a couple sets that we're going to talk about. The first one is seeing. This is being introspective into your program and taking a look around at what's available. Um, the first set here of seeing commands is display, undisplay, which is just the opposite of display, uh, p, which is just evaluates an expression, uh, and um, m, and if you, it's a little hard to tell here, but method instance um, tells you what method, instance methods an object has, um, and then method class, and then the name of a module or class file will tell you all the class methods for that class. Um, var global shows you all the global variables that are currently assigned. Uh, var local shows you all the local variables. Var instance and the name of an object shows you all of that object's instance variables. Uh, var const object will show you all of the constants defined for that object. So I'm going to stop for a second, actually boot up the debugger and show you that those things in action, get a little better understanding of them. All right. Uh, we're going to launch this. Okay, so what I have here is the um, SD Ruby code base. And we can see here that in my project controller, I put a debugger statement. So if I launch um, this code and anything that runs against this code with the debug statement in here, it'll stop at this, this guy. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to run the project controller spec. Where is that? Do I not have that open? Here, uh, and that's going to get us to our debug statement. So, let's see, am I in the right place? Yes. All right, so this is what it looks like when we first get to a debug statement. Um, we can see that it's shown us where in the code we're located. We can see what file we're in. We can see basically where we are. Um, and we can now sort of take a look around and, and interact with this program. Um, one thing that's worth noting in the seeing step, even though it's not explicit, is if you don't put any debugger command in front of whatever you type in, it will just evaluate it. So if it looks first to see, is this a recognized debugger command? If not, just eval. So if I do at projects, we see that that's nil currently at the place where we're at. Um, and if I do p at projects, we'll see that that does the exact same thing. Um, I pretty much never type p because it's assumed um, and not really super valuable. Um, one thing that is worthwhile to note here in the debugger is if you are um, playing around with values, uh, for instance, if you wanted to see, you know, say, uh, string equals hello, right, and then string dot g sub l for big L, right, that works fine. Um, but you can't use single letter variable name assignments. So we can't do s equals hello. Uh, s works. Some certain ones of these don't work. Basically all the ones that happen to be debug commands. And the debugger will freak out in a fairly uh, unobvious error message. So you're better off just making sure you name them things that are a little more uh, full. Um, it's not just the debug command list. There's also some registers that I don't really ever use for anything that are reserved, but that basically I just stay away from single letter variable names in the debugger. Which of course when you're using the debugger, you're just doing something you're going to throw away. It becomes very tempting, but you know, that's not a, that's a dangerous habit. Uh, we can do display. Uh, so we're going to display at projects. And now we see here that it says, okay, projects equals and nothing. Um, but as we move through the thing, the, um, as we move through our code here, can you guys see this at all? 
Okay, good. Uh, we can see here that projects equals now and then this project object. Um, and we can have four or five of those that just every time we move in the program, it's going to just continue to show us the values of those things. So if you're looking at three or four variables as you're debugging and you're just putting them over and over and over again, you can do this instead and it'll just display them for you. Uh, we can look at um, the global variables. This becomes uh, a fairly long list here in Rails, because we're in a Rails instance here, um, but not too terrible. Or fortunately, there's not that much stuff in the global space, about half of its debug statements. Um, and we can see um, oops. We can see the locally defined variables. We can see that I defined S and I defined string. Otherwise, there really isn't anything going on here. So that gives you an idea of how those things work. Um, and just to show you method, uh, I think it's I. Nope. There's nothing wrong with looking at the documentation. There we go. And we got a list of all of the methods that are defined on this array. Okay. So switching back to our slides here. Uh, the next piece of information that you need to know um, for working with a debugger is how to actually move through the code. This basically continues along your journey in your code, uh, getting to the next place. Um, the three you'll use the most um, probably are uh, C for continue, step, and next. The difference between step and next is step will dive deeper in. So if you make a call to say find, it's going to go to where find is defined and show you the, the steps in find. And as you step through those, it's going to keep going down deeper and deeper into your program until it gets to something that just simply evals and returns and then bring you back up the stack, right? So um, if you're using a object that has uh, a definition in another file, you call a method on that object, it's going to take you to that method definition. You can then step through everything that that method does in depth. Next says, go ahead and execute this find operation, and then bring me to the next line at the same level of the program. So here we can see. Uh, we're right here on this featured, um, sorry, there we go. We can see we're right here on this featured project equals project.featured. Um, and if we want to code just be at this at, uh, at users equals users.all without going through the depth um, of whatever the uh, dot feature method is, um, we can type next instead of step. And then um, finish finishes the current method. So it just takes you to wherever the return statement is or our end statement and uh, moves on to whatever the next level up in the code is. Um, and then quit is just like, all right, I'm done leaving the debugger completely. If you do this in a running server process, it will exit the server process completely. So it stops all execution and does not continue in any way. The third sort of grouping of debugger commands that I want to talk about tonight are um, where am I, right? You're in the debugger, you're moving up and down the stack, you're uh, moving from file to file. It's really easy to get lost and not really know what's going on. Um, and so these commands all come in handy. Um, to be honest with you, the one I use the most is list. Just knowing what code line I'm about to execute is the most useful thing for me. Um, and uh, but where can also be useful for certain deep debugging uh, concepts. Let's take a look at that. So uh, you saw me use list already. Uh, list has some interesting features. We can do list minus, which is going to show us um, just the sort of the lines above in the method we're in, which there aren't really. 
We can do list equals, which shows us our current line, and we can do list, and this will continue to show you further and further down the file. You'll see it sort of scrolling down here. Uh, plus, oh, we're at the end there. So list equals is the one you end up using the most, just knowing where you are. Um, hopefully your methods are fairly short and then you're not struggling with page after page. All right. So some other groups of commands in the debugger um, are setting breakpoints and watch points. Since the majority of my use case for the debugger, and I think in general the majority of the good use case for the debugger is to be um, debugging the code as you're writing it or as you're working with your specs, uh, I just set breakpoints using the debugger command in my code. Um, you can manually set them, um, but uh, I just I don't very often. Um, it's a fairly uh, powerful syntax, so you can set a breakpoint based on uh, the name of a method, an object, the line number in a file, um, and uh, in reference to your existing concept uh, context. You can say I want to break in five lines. Um, Watch points and breakpoints, it's really hard sometimes to figure out what the difference between those two is. Uh, breakpoints are places where you stop execution. Um, watch points let you watch for evaluable events. So say you want to find out, you want to stop whenever foo equals six, and you're doing a loop, right? So you would set a watch point for foo equals six, and then say continue, and when it gets to that value, it's going to stop. Um, and then the other set of debugger commands are the thread manipulation commands, which are uh, pretty obviously for uh, manipulating uh, various threads and using the debugger in a threaded Ruby situation. Uh, even though there are tools built into the debugger for debugging multi-threaded applications, it's confusing as hell. Like, it's really hard to keep track of what's going on. Um, on the other hand, when you have a race condition in your threaded application, this is one of the only definitive ways to really find it. So um, if you're doing a lot of multi-threaded Ruby, this is a, a really valuable uh, piece of the debugger to get familiar with. So uh, a real common situation uh, is if you're running either PAL or Passenger or some other uh, server-based, um, either Sinatra app or you know, other rack-based application stack, uh, Rails also. Um, and there's this really cool tool. Uh, there's like four or five tools that solve this problem. As far as I know, there's only one that does it well. Uh, it's called Rack Debug. Um, you can see that DDollar actually has two other cracks at this solving the same problem, and this is the third one, and the one that's actually maintained. Um, it's really easy to, to get in, up and running in your application. You add Rack Debug to your gem file, or if you're using the old style config.gem commands. Um, and then in your development.rb, you require rack debug and um, set rack debug as your middleware. Uh, there's a difference in Rails 2.3 versus Rails 3.0 and 3.1. Uh, it used to be that um, middlewares were declared as strings, which you can see here in the example, and now they have to actually be, you have to send in the actual classes themselves. Um, and then you need to require the rake tasks in your rake file which is only one rake task. So uh, once you've done those things, you restart your passenger instance, and then you start rake debugger. And I'll show you how this all looks right now. So we see here that we have the SD Ruby app. Make that the right size here. And we have our debug statement and project still. In development, we've added a require for rack debug, and we're using the middleware uh, in our rake file. We've added the debug tasks. And in our gem file, we have rack debug. Uh, one thing in my talk earlier, I talked about using the platform guard. Um, if you are only targeting a specific Ruby version, you don't have to have it. It's not required. Uh, it is, however, good practice. Um, and uh, so now all we need to do is exit this debug session. We um, can see here that we can restart Passenger. Now, we need to go sort of start the Passenger instance. I know I'm not on the internet, but you can still render that page. 
You know what? Hmm? Yeah, but uh, PAL runs Passenger. It's just having a fit because Safari knows that I'm not on the internet. You like how my Firefox renders when it first comes up? That's awesome. Well, this is just a remnant of being on another man monitor. Don't get smart with me. Remember a couple minutes ago, Chris, when we were talking about the rule of live demos? Well, I normally use Chrome, but I don't use it for demos because then all my random crap pops up. I am uh, frequently have seven or eight tabs open just waiting for me to get back to. It's not a really good storage method, but it works. Here we go. All right. We convinced it to actually look at localhost. Um, and uh, so now we can see if we go load the projects. We don't get any projects because we're not online. But it does load the page just fine. This is this project's index method. Um, and now if we come back over here and we go rake debug, it makes some noise. And it says connected. This is the, the money shot down here. It's time to update all the dependencies on the SD Ruby app again. Feels like every time we go to work on it, that's the case. So now if I go to projects, we'll see that this guy's going to spin for a little while. Come back over to my terminal. Look at that. We're in our debugger. So this is debugging a live passenger thread um, on my system. So we're just going to say continue because we've already looked at all the passenger commands. And now we'll see that the page did actually render the same as it did before. All right. IDEs. Uh, Emacs, Vim, Redmine, uh, there are three or four others have support for the Ruby debugger. Um, it's a separate gem called Ruby Debug IDE or Ruby Debug 1.9 IDE. Um, it is a talk in and of itself trying to get even one of them set up, much less a bunch of them. Uh, RubyMine actually comes with support for out of the box pretty well. Um, this is a typo. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> that's all right. We're almost done. Ta-da! <laughs> All right. Um, and uh, it's not Friday yet, so I can't update LibreOffice. I'll do it tomorrow. Um, anyway, so the RubyMine actually has a pretty good um, default setup that uses, allows you to use the debugger. And, and it works just like, um, like the Eclipse debugger or some of the GDB style debuggers um, that I've used in the past where you click on the side and it puts the little red stop sign. Uh, the, Debugger and JavaScript debugger and Firefox and Chrome work the same way. Um, but uh, getting it going in Emacs is uh, a terrible trial. I was never successful, even though I used Emacs for a whole year. Getting it going in Vim is a little easier, but it's uh, never really got into my workflow. I tend to uh, end up just dropping into the command line to do my debugging. So um, there are a couple graphical debugger tools, standalone graphical debuggers for Ruby. I'm not going to talk about any of them because it's sad. 
Next steps. Uh, there's a pretty good Rails guide on using the debugger in Rails, um, if that's your, your poison. Um, the uh, documentation is pretty thorough. It talks about a few Rails-specific uh, kinds of tasks that you might want to do with the debugger. Um, mostly, it just shows you the things I, I already showed you, but you know, it's worth taking a look at. Um, another tool that's more recent on the um, landscape is called Pry. Uh, and Pry has some really fantastic debugger integration. Um, you'll recognize all the commands. They make it sound like they just invented all of them, but they're just the Ruby debugger. Um, it's a replacement for IRB um, that has a lot of promise and is pluggable and does some really cool things and is worth taking a look at. Uh, to get color uh, syntax highlighting and all the bells and whistles that you might want in an IRB session and in your debugger. Um, and I like the idea of having that all be one set of tools, so I'm not trying to remember what the difference between IRB sessions and debugger sessions are, because that can be a pain. All right, that's it. Again, I'm Rob Kaufman with Notch 8. And, uh, we are looking to bring on some new clients for our consulting company. So if uh, you're looking for work or uh, have work you're looking to get done um, for quality Ruby and Rails consulting, let me know. Any questions? Yes, Gyron, you can use it with Postgres. Uh, I just want to say uh, I use a Ruby mine, and the reason I do it is because it makes this stuff uh, really easy, and you don't have to remember commands. Or that that seems too much like programming with a magnetized needle, in comparison. So. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I think that uh, over time, as programmers, like we start out with our put statements, and then maybe we learn the command line debugger. But yeah, a graphical debugger can be a pretty awesome tool once you get it up and going. And I, I do know that Ruby mine makes that pretty painless. Um, so yeah, I was wondering, you know, in, in your sort of day-to-day -day, um, debugging stuff, are you using this exclusively, or is, is it the kind of tool you, you crack open when you, you hit a really hard problem you can't solve? So most of my uh, try something, see if it works, change it, try it, see if it works code is all specs in our spec. Um, and uh, I use the uh, Ruby debug in correlation with our spec a lot. Uh, you'll notice that in my example for running it from the command line, I ran it via spec. Um, that's my 99% case. Um, I very rarely put, put statements in my codes anymore to do that same work. Um, and I am not always nice about deleting other people's put statements when I find them hidden in the code. So I tend to just go in and, and feel like that if you need them, you can recover them from Git. And by the way, there is a set of scripts out there I didn't put a link to um, that check your code for debugger statements before you can commit um, and stop you from committing them. It's kind of nice, you know. Got to remember to tidy up after yourself. All right, thanks guys.